Just a quick note for those watching us on YouTube, uh, we had some technical difficulties uh, in this conversation. Uh, you'll see uh, that our guests change clothes about halfway in between, so we record on two different days. Uh, we, we hope that that doesn't at all uh, it, you know, diminish the quality of the conversation. I think we got a lot of really good stuff here. Just wanted to give you a heads up on that. We tried to make it as fluid as possible. Uh, if you were listening to it, it you may not even notice the transition, but you will, you will see a little bit of change in scenery there uh, a little bit. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Um, I appreciate our guests for their patience uh, with, you know, between here and Belgium, uh, we, we had some technical glitches, but uh, hopefully we're delivering you a high quality video experience of the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Enjoy this episode. Welcome friends to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I'm here with a very special guest today, uh, Levin Van Linden, um, who I met uh, talking about heart rate variability, uh, realized that we had a shared passion for this work, uh, Levin has a fascinating uh, backstory. Uh, I remember uh, Levin before our first call, I looked at your bio on the Built for Endurance website and I, I just got like, I cannot wait to talk to this guy. Uh, we talked and I, I uh, immediately asked you to join the podcast. So I'm really excited to talk about your personal journey and your professional journey uh, with heart rate variability, because you you are a uh, fascinating individual, and I love how you think about this. So I'd love uh, just a, a little bit of introduction uh, uh, for our audience. I let me just introduce yourself uh, before we dive in. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for for having me. Uh, it's great to talk with someone who's also so passionate about heart rate variability because to be honest i don't meet that many people nowadays <laughs> who are already that passionate about heart rate variability i try to 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 share a little bit of the passion but uh it's still somewhere under the radar um, <laughs> but well all that passion can just flow out through the next hour or so so yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah like you mentioned my name is levin i live in belgium so uh belgium europe a very small uh, very small country um i am 39 years old i'm going to marry in about one month Congratulations. Uh, I, I, all, thanks i was already married some years ago so it's my second marriage <laughs> uh so this time it's it's a good marriage um i'm an entrepreneur i have my own company like you mentioned the name built for endurance is the name where the name originates from my own journey of endurance races uh, in life um so yeah I'm, I'm an entrepreneur i work with business leaders with uh, managers people who try to make a difference in business life but also in their own private life um, and we use data and often, of course, heart rate variability is in the center of the data that we use to, to help them understand their body in a better way, give them some insights about the impact of their lifestyle on their nervous system and on their heart rate variability. And then also give them the tools to help them to, to improve, improve their health. But of course, not only their health, also all the other areas in life and business which improve when you improve your heart rate variability. Um, so that's what we uh, so that's what we do and i'm also uh, passionate about challenges in life um and let, let's talk person. about let's, let's talk about some of those because <laughs> um like, like i said they they jump from out of your bio like wow uh so so what i i, I we we haven't had this discussion yet either i'd love to just what drew you to i'll let you share what you've done uh but but what led you to taking on some of these incredible challenges uh, yeah. uh, that, that I, I just can't even imagine uh, what they must have been like. So I, I just love to, what, what got you into this endurance sports and share some of your highlights uh, uh, mm -hmm. with our listeners. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. So I've been running indeed a couple of endurance races all over the world, uh, these endurance ultra marathon races. So where you have to run for, a couple of one, a couple of hundred kilometers, a couple of hundred miles uh, across, yeah, very, uh, yeah, very challenging areas. Uh, I've run in the Morocco desert. Uh, I've run in Brazil a marathon in the jungle, a marathon, multiple marathons. It was two hundred sixty kilometers, divided over six days. 
where you had to carry yeah, your own backpack, your food, your water supply. Uh, so it was a fully self-sufficient race. Of course, water was given by the by the organizer organizers of those races because you cannot carry water for six days <laughs> in your backpack. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to support us a little bit. Um, so yeah. For some reason, and I think there are a couple of reasons why I started doing those endurance races, but yeah, I always enjoyed and I'm still enjoying the outdoors, the unknown challenge, because I think to grow as a human in life, we, yeah, we do not grow from staying in our comfort zone. We need to challenge ourselves a little bit once in a while and maybe a little bit hard once in a while to grow. Um, so and that's what made me do this kind of endurance races because it, actually I'm a soccer player uh, or I, I was when I was still younger a soccer player but it didn't give me enough <clears throat> enough challenge in life so uh, there was this one moment where I said okay I'm going to quit and I'm going to look for something else um, so, so and that's I, I why that. what is it about you though <laughs> because some like there, there's a lot of people that might, Hey, I'm going to run a half marathon or, or I might run a full marathon. You, you decide to go to the jungles of Brazil and run hundreds of miles. Like, well, what, what was it to say? Like, yeah, you know, I, 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 was it right off the bat? You wanted to do these big endurance things or did something kind of click uh, along the way that said, Hey, I, I really want to do something uh, mm. out of the ordinary. Yeah. Um, it's it's not that I gradually build up towards this challenge. <laughs> so there was this moment where after I quit playing soccer for one year, I was, I was partying, I was going out, uh, I was gaining weight. And then there was this Belgian TV producer who ran this Marathon de Sable in Morocco. Yeah. And I, it was for me like, wow, this must be amazing to do it. And uh, I'm quite, uh, how you call it, risk averse. So I'm not seeing too much of any risks in life. <laughs> so uh, I'm just like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to register myself for this race. I'm going to start training. I'm going to see a doctor who can uh, support me a little bit along the journey. And and that's that's how it started. And then I did this one race in Morocco and I finished 29th out of thousand participants from all over the world. Easy. So I was this 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 green guy, uh, never ran another race before, who finished somewhere at the top and I was like, hmm, maybe maybe I'm made for this. Or, uh, and that's when it all started and I started to to yeah, run multiple races and afterwards um, also maybe a little bit driven by external motivation back then uh, i was always looking for meaning in life purpose how can i grow um working hard on my career and i was always looking for these external big events that hopefully would give me enough satisfaction uh, so it was there was always also this this sense of purpose which was linked to to running these ultra marathons uh, because it's true suffering that you try to find meaning in the suffering uh, uh so and these are enduring these races you you suffer a lot <laughs> yeah I can, I can only imagine uh what, what that went through so was it during this training and these events when, when did you find heart rate variability when did that come on your radar um actually it's it's only for me i think five six years ago right before COVID. Yeah. Because when I was running these first races, I was just we wearing, it was 2013, 2014, a regular wearable was not yet measuring heart rate variability. It was just heart rate that we're measuring. Uh, it's while kind now of a bummer because I would love to see your, what, what does uh, a couple hundred kilometers do in the desert to your heart rate variability? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Maybe that's that's worth trying uh, yeah. during a new, new challenge. <laughs> there you go. You got to do it again for me because I'm going to see the now. <laughs> but nowadays, people uh, who, these, these cyclists who, who train for the Tour de France yep. or who do the Tour de France, they measure their heart rate variability. Uh, and they see a big difference between the, the mountain races and, and yeah. regular races in their recovery abil abilities. <clears throat> but um, but yeah, it was it was not yet there when I discovered heart rate variability. It was actually 
they are a little bit later, so 2000, I think 2019, um, 2018, 2019, when it became more popular already in, in standard wearables. Um, because of, of my, my job as an entrepreneur with my company Built for Endurance, we help business leaders <clears throat> to improve their well-being and performance. And you know, when you want to help business leaders, they want to see data, they want to have science, they want to, to have it backed. And well-being as a topic, it's still kind of fluffy in the business environment. So I'm an engineer as a background, so I'm always looking to find to find the science and, and the proof behind things and why they work. Um, and that's how I stumbled upon a heart rate variability at first through the breathing techniques to improve your heart rate variability, like heart coherence breathing. Um, I discovered heart math. Um, and then I went in yeah, into the rabbit hole and I found that yeah, heart rate variability is, is actually uh, influenced by so many lifestyle uh, factors <clears throat> that, um, yeah, I started writing a bo book on it. So now there's a, there's a book, uh, okay, you cannot see it, yeah, fully charged. There, yes. Where, yeah, yeah, like this, Very so cool. fully charged. <laughs> So, uh, because I found out, yeah, for me, heart rate vari variability is a North Star metric if you want to track your performance, your resilience, your anti-fragility, however you want to call it. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's why we use heart rate variability now in our professional life. But also me personally, I track it not uh, completely as a freak or I try to not be a, a complete freak in doing so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I track it to see and, and to have supportive data to see uh, how I'm doing in life. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so how do you go about? We're working with in the business world because obviously it's something you know I've thought a lot about uh, with my heartbeat a business book. And how do you how do you think about uh, how do you introduce it to executives or other business people who may have not have heard of heart rate variability? uh before yeah um yeah at, at first instance we we asked them the question okay how do you monitor or track or what's your kpi mm -hmm. to track your own personal performance and how do you how do you measure it and there's no one who has like a clear a clear answer to it uh so so that's already an entrance point for heart to to drop heart rate variability and show why it is of so importance not only for your personal health but also for your your thinking your decision making uh your behavior uh and your even financial results so there are there are many reasons why to introduce an heart rate variability often clients or potential clients they come to us with the question okay our executive team is having a hard time uh, they're exhausted uh, they are suffering um they want some some tools to help them to to perform in a sustainable way um and that's where we then first yeah come with this kind of assessment where we give them insights about their nervous system when they are in stress when they are in recovery and relaxation so and these assessments of course they also measure heart rate variability or use heart rate variability to indicate whether you're in an activated state or in a relaxed state um and and then we help them to understand when their body is, is activated and when is it relaxed and whether it's balanced or not and and how their sleep is and then we dive in in all these lifestyle topics and we help them to discover for themselves the the uh, the relationship between their lifestyle and the signals that their body their bodies are giving very cool. So I, I'd be interested, uh, what led to the book? Tell us a little bit about Fully Charged. Yeah, so what, what led to writing Fully Charged? Um, yeah, actually, I noticed over the past five, six, seven years when I was working with different types of corporations and businesses, that this topic of well-being, um, resilience, how you can call it, that it's always has been perceived as a quite fluffy topic. Um so it was positioned in the HR department and they try with all the good intentions to, to help employees to, to improve their, their well-being or their resilience. But I noticed that for many employees, these topics remains fluffy and people had difficulties to get engaged. 
So with my background as an engineer, because I'm a me mechanical engineer, with that background and my experience as an ultra runner, and also my experience in working with, with corporations, I was thinking about a framework which could help people to understand what the relationship is between a good functioning nervous system and behavior on the outside and results on the outside. Because for many people in companies, uh, having good results still remains a, a cognitive topic and they do not understand the role of the nervous system in, in, in the results and, and doing business. So I wanted to make it more tangible. I wanted to give some explanation about the role of the nervous system um, and also give a lot of tools to help people in a scientific based way to improve the functioning of the nervous system. Also measurable, of course, with, with heart rate variability as the North Star metric. That's how I position heart rate variability in the book. Uh, a North Star metric to make it a little bit more tangible when you work on your own on your own health and, and resilience. I would love to hear some of the reactions that that you have gotten, because I think here in the States, at least, you know, self-care, which is a term I don't use anymore, but it was like it was on the individual to sort of go home and take care of themselves and come back magically. If you think about it from a nervous system, person, magically come back to work the next day, ready to perform at their best. <laughs> And I wonder as a leader who may have been under, you know, not thought about this from a scientific perspective, how do you start to get buy-in? Because I'm assuming the leadership are the, probably the ones reaching out to you, at least initially, mm -hmm. the ones, you know, approving the contract for you uh, to work with them. So I would love to to just get some coaching from you and, and how do you help uh, leaders kind of see, uh, to start to look at their employees and their workforce uh, in in a different way and connecting that to performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, very very good question. Um, if if I look from a from a distance to current business leaders, and that's with uh, with all due respect, but many of them they're walking brains, and uh, they're they're the whole day they're they're in their heads, yeah, making decisions, and people have forgotten that they also have a body which is giving signals to the brain and also in the other direction. Um, so people lost their their awareness of having a body which is quite important in also doing the brain work. Yeah. Um, so as as with with many interventions, the first step towards change is bringing awareness into the situation, and and that's where I noticed that to get people engaged in these type of topics, you have to meet them at the place where they are. You, ha you do not have to say immediately, okay, start breathing, connect with your body, feel the sensations. And these, these fluffy words, it, it doesn't match with, with how they work. So uh, you have to meet them where they are and that's in their brain. So we use data then and heart rate variability and stress measurements and bi these biometrical assessments as a way to show these business leaders, what the signals are that they are receiving from their body, that when they are during the day, having a lot of back-to-back -back meetings, that they're working late in the evening with a lot of blue lights, that it's really impacting their nervous system, their sleep. And that's when you get these aha moments like, oh my God, yeah, I knew that alcohol was completely destroying my sleep, but I didn't know the impact was so big. So it's a lot of open doors but um yeah you, you just create awareness and because it's so personal it's about the own physiological reactions of the body that they they see on a graph that they have something like oh my god yeah this is real i have a body it's giving me signals i cannot feel them anymore because i'm always in my brain but now i see it and now i start to believe it and that's when you start to get engagement in to uh, in this kind of uh, in this kind of programs that we uh, that we run with uh, with companies and with leaders so we meet them in their brain with showing them the data the insights we take them into these journeys where we use data and combine it with with experiences cold baths uh, intense exercises breath work experiences like wim hof breathing uh, and the combination of of data and experience is very powerful, we notice, in, in driving behavioral change.
Awesome. So, so how do you, I, I'd love to kind of talk about how you set up that behavioral change. Cause one of the things that, that I, I spend a lot of time, how do we help people build healthy habits? So is that where kind of heart rate variability as a, a metric really comes into play as well as like showing them that, you know, whether it's like a cold shower or whatever it might be, different breathing exercises that this can actually really improve uh, HRV and that they can see it more tangibly over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really having the, the biofeedback and, and this device telling them that, oh, yeah, your HRV is improving or your baseline is improving, you're doing well, or oh, you have a, a downward trend, so you need to watch out because maybe you have too much stress and you're overloaded. Um, it's this this continuous loop of, of feedback that's really helpful for people to to change behaviors and to 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 support them on their on their way. There are so many people who buy an aura ring and a whoop after a workshop with us that they say like, oh my God, this HRV is so interesting. I'm going to start to measure it. And, and people buy all these uh, gadgets, of course, and these wearables. Yeah. Although we know the accuracy is not not the best in the market, but still it gives an indication, it gives a trend and it, it gets them started. Yeah, absolutely. I'm wondering, because over here in the States, we, we have an epidemic right now of burnout. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Gallup just came out with uh, 60, 59% uh, of the population says they're, they're burned out, which is, which is really a public health uh, potential catastrophe for not just the work, you know, the, the employers, but for, for everybody's health. I'm wondering if you're seeing, I'm, I'm sure you run across people who are potentially really struggling. And I wonder kind of how, mm -hmm. you know, here you come in, you, you run hundreds of miles through jungles and desert <laughs> and you maybe, you may find someone like me who just like barely getting through the day. And if I get through the day at work, I'm not necessarily being, you know, maybe the parent or a spouse I want to be when I go home. So I wonder as, as a, a, a role model for like peak endurance performance, I'm sure you meet some people who might be really, really struggling in borderline mental health issues because of dysregulated nervous systems. How do you sort mm -hmm. of approach those folks uh, knowing they're not ready to jump up to sort of that maybe a high performing level, but kind of meeting them where they're at and getting a plan for them to, uh, I, I like to call it a recovery plan to, to kind of get back to a, a healthy state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe to start with, of course, I'm not encouraging anyone to to run uh, multiple uh, <laughs> marathons in the in the desert, or that's not the end the end goal or the end destination. That's the, uh, that's the platinum think, package if you want to get. Yeah, to <laughs> I think it will do more harm uh, to to people. But um, yeah, what we we notice is, of course, we um, I, many people we work with. They are, yeah, they are. I, many of them are going towards exhaustion. The, the the figures you're mentioning, Gallup, also in Europe, we see, and, and Europe and Belgium and Netherlands and and France and the countries you work with, um, we also see the same trends. A lot of people going into burnout, into exhaustion, having difficulties to to manage themselves. Um, what we very practically do is we we just look at their calendars and, and with the, the measurements that we do the devices that we use people need to register their their behavior the their uh, their meetings their whole schedule into this application and they get this yeah confrontation with how their nervous system is is functioning and based on that, we, we start with very small changes to see, okay, where in your routines, in your morning, in your evening, where can you just adapt your schedule a little bit, which can give you a, a little bit more head, headspace. Um, so it's it's about finding the, the, the sweet spot because those people, they're over busy. Yeah? It's from morning until the evening. They have, like, there's always more work to do. Um, so of course it's, first thing they they there need to be a willingness to change and this willingness you can get to that point by showing them the data about their own body and once you have the the willingness to change we very practically dive into their schedule and see okay what are you doing from monday until friday how 
are you managing your mornings? What do you do in the evening? Last hour before you go to sleep, two hours before you go to sleep. So very practically, we dive into their schedule and we're then going to see, okay, where's the disbalance? What's what's going to, to take the least time to have the biggest impact? And that's how we try to, to see where we can drive change. Awesome. So I love to ask this question about people who've taken the time to write a book, because one of the things I love about writing the bo books, uh, as you can see in my background, I just don't stop. Uh, I basically, I write <laughs> because I want to write them if other people want to read them. It's just <laughs> on top of it. Um, but I love it because you have to think about things in a kind of a different way. If you're talking to somebody about something that's one way, I do a lot of presenting. So that's a different way. When, when you really put it down on paper, you know it's going to stay on that page for the foreseeable future, right? That, that you can't like go back and necessarily, you don't want to go change it every week. Um, yeah. But you can do with how I talk to people, how I present. You know, my 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 pre presentation two weeks later could be totally different if I wanted it to be and nobody would be the wiser. So I wonder as you went through writing the book, I just, you know, what insights kind of popped out to you? What were some of the, the things that you may have had to like just kind of epiphanies or insights um, through putting all the knowledge you've accumulated in written mm -hmm. form for maybe somebody who's just just heard about heart rate variability or or heard you speak or talk and wanted to learn more? Uh, I'd love to just hear any uh, what your process was like in putting uh, yeah. paper in writing the book yeah yeah really really interesting because yeah indeed i didn't it, it's my first book which i have written so uh i didn't know up front what i was getting into what i which journey <laughs> i started so it just with the blank page i started to write and then i noticed oh my god there's so much information how can i just bring it back to something readable for someone who doesn't know about the, an autonomic nervous system or heart rate variability, all these complex topics, how to make it more easy to read. It was really, really a big challenge, but it's something I love because I've been a, a consultant before, a strategic management consultant. So I always loved to to have complex problems and, and try to conceptualize it into a framework or something, a one pager, which is understandable by, by people. So also for, for my book, I, I came up with this energy model. That's how I, I called it, which is actually, I tried to, to understand. Uh, I, I, I've always worked in companies on process optimization. Uh, in a process, you have an input, you have a process and you have an output. It can be in a production line or anything. I also wanted to understand as a human being, what's our input, what's happening then inside of us that is causing the output. And with the output, I say, I mean our behavior and our results. So what's in the end causing a specific behavior? And that's how I approached it. And then I, I started to dive into, okay, we have a conscious part of what we are doing, but 95% of what we do is, is unconscious. And then with the unconscious part of what's causing our behavior, what's the role of the autonomic nervous system in this? And so that's where I designed in this book, this, this really, this, I, I really like it, this, this framework, this process where it comes down to, okay, if you want to change your behavior, 80% of this behavior is caused by your autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start at, at uh, some point to change, start with your physiology. That was actually what I wanted to prove. Um, and then I make this metaphor between the nervous system um, that it's actually influencing your body battery. It's like Garmin is, is visualizing it because I really love this, this way of looking at it. When you're activated, your body is draining energy. When you're a relaxed parasympathetic um, dominant, then your body is, is gaining energy. So this metaphor is really... Yeah, easy for people to understand. Okay, when you're active, can be positive, can be negative stress, it's draining your body, but your nervous system can also replenish energy. And that's actually how I divided my book. I have this chapter on, okay, when you have, I, let's say, 100% of energy level, how can you use it as efficient as possible? So this chapter is on focus, productivity, doing one task at the same time. So that's about energy usage. 
A second chapter is on, okay, if you have used your energy efficiently, how can you replenish it? It's about sleep, breaks, what are things which can bring your nervous system into relaxation? And then the third chapter is about how can you, if you have 100% energy now, how can you improve your energy level to 120%? So these are interventions on yeah, improving your heart rate variability um, and bringing it to, to the next level. So this makes it really easy for the reader to, to, to understand a little bit what's happening in the body. It's, of course, a simplified version, but it's very tangible and, and practical to work with. I love it. And, and I love that you mentioned that this is, I, I won't go down my own rabbit hole here because I <laughs> this is kind of what I've been obsessed about, uh, you know, intellectually is the, the, not, the, as you mentioned, the unconscious. And I think in many ways in my fields of psychology that we, we Freud and all the focus on the unconscious, we kind of, we we remove we we moved away from that with cognitive behavioral therapy and other other mm -hmm. more evidence based models and, and I've just been really fascinated especially you know with the autonomic nervous system reacting and maintaining homeostasis really independent of consciousness for the most part now I think you and I both agree if you can catch yourself with and heart rate variability is a great metric to do that you know, getting stressed out, you know, you can take conscious action to regulate, but, but so mm -hmm. much of that is done. So a neuroception and am I safe or am I in danger adjusting to stress without conscious intervention that, that I, that's, I mean, I've just been so fascinated by that. Um, so much of this is just under consciousness. And I, I kind of point, if you're listening, I'm kind of pointing the brainstem down, um, yeah. you know, and obviously it's one integrated system, but so much of that is unconscious. And I, I'm like, how do we bring this back into our thinking? Uh, because it really is so scientific now. We just like, it's not necessarily it's super ego, you know, ego. We're talking about parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous systems which are actually, I think, a lot more powerful than uh, libido and other things that we were trying to label things we thought we were seeing. So I, I love that you bring that up and because I think it's something that we need to talk more about too. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And then a, a, an important topic, which I actually do not tackle in the, in this book, I will say, maybe in the next one. Yeah, you don't next book, there that, you go. <laughs> that, that's everything about trauma, eh? uh, because of course, Trauma is having a lot of impact on, on the unconscious uh, behavior. Important topic also when you talk about dysregulated nervous system. So, but let's say this is the first step, the, the, the superficial layer of, of health, which I try to, to tackle. But if you then talk about trauma, of course, it's an all other world that you're uh, opening yeah. up. Uh, and, and in a business environment, it's still like, uh, it's early stage that this is, um, yeah, some maybe more mature, corporations they also work about uh, trauma in the organization but there are not too many companies yet who are on that level of consciousness i would say yeah and, and i'm and I, i'd love to get you I, i'm just going to use you as a coach for the rest of the podcast because i <laughs> but but i think what i've been doing and I, I work over here in the states with the highest uh with industries that have the highest rates of burnout. So we're in a burned out society right now in healthcare, education, social services, you know, government, those, those are the industries I, I primarily work in and they're the most burned out. I, I really want people to think about, you know, and I, I use a scale for burnout. I don't think one bad day is traumatic unless it's a really, really bad day. Somebody gets hurt or, there's a, a life-threatening situation. It can be, there can be an event there, but like over time as people exist for weeks and months and years in burnout, that that can be tra traumatic. We have something called chronic trauma um, that is, you know, not the traumatic event. Somebody pulls out a gun, you know, that's a traumatic mm -hmm. event, but we know existing in high stress situations for sustained periods of time, which I think is a good, definition of burnout is traumatic for folks mm -hmm. um, if you look at the outcomes of burnout over time you know stroke diabetes cancer anxiety disorders all these different depression 
you know, you put up trauma symptoms and they're almost a perfect match in that. So mm -hmm. that's one of the ways, you know, and I don't start there with the conversation, but I think it raises the idea of burnout to a, a, a more important mental health issue than sometimes, oh, that person's weak. That's why they're burned out. It's like, no, this is an organizational phenomenon, mm -hmm. which can at times, I'm not saying everybody's traumatized, but can at times lead to a traumatic response, which can be devastating for folks. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And I, I just to build on that conversation, I think the difficulty is that many organizations, they struggle with the question, okay, up until where do we have as an organization the responsibility to do something to help people with these type of topics? Yeah? What is part of the the personal life and what's part of the work environment yes. and of course those are not those two are not separated and right. and with 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 covid those two uh, are are just melting into each other they've always been melted into each other but now it's becoming really obvious um and and these are questions that many organizations struggle with okay what's my responsibility what should yeah. i do and and also the employee is often looking to the employer as in help me but yeah. actually, it's your responsibility, employer, and I'm not going to take the responsibility. And that's also a wrong idea. So it, it's there's a lot this is this tension on on yeah. okay, who can do what? Um yeah. And and I love that what you just mentioned perfectly sums up like what I'm trying to get people to talk about and is the dilemma of you know, and I you you may I assume you're gonna agree with me on this, but like the number one thing you and I can do probably to bring our best self to work tomorrow is to get eight hours of healthy sleep tonight. That that's sort yeah. of rises very quickly in the research and kind of stays number one for, for most people. Uh, your employer has nothing to do, hopefully, with you getting eight hours of healthy sleep. Now we could talk about sleep hygiene and other things, but really that's the personal responsibility. But like things like burnout are a work phenomenon about something might be toxic within the work environment. And I think mm -hmm. that gives us a great dilemma to talk about. That's what I'm encouraging leaders to do right now is talk about, hey, our ability to perform at our best and get the best outcomes uh, for our business is a mix of that personal responsibility and creating collectively creating an environment that is healthy and people can really thrive in supporting healthy habits at work as well. And I think it's that dilemma that if we have conversations around it, hopefully we find mm -hmm. We find both is how, how, yeah. do we, how do we train people on sleep hygiene? Like you're, I'm sure you do. Like not everybody knows the importance. I think we're getting more there, but of eight hours of sleep or eating anti-inflammatory versus inflammatory foods or getting movement, the zone mm -hmm. two craze, which I, I, I don't think is going to go away. There may be something trendier come up, but I think that's I, the science there is so strong. So that's what I find is is really important as we talk about this. And it sounds like that's yeah. what you're what, that's what you're doing as well with uh, the folks you work with too. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And that's also the interesting thing when we worked with these biometrical assessments. They uh, the the device we use it measures the autonomic nervous system in a period of four to five days. And it's day and night. So automatically, okay, every individual gets their own report, but automatically the topic of sleep gets into the conversation and people see their own sleep scores, yeah. whether it's green or red, uh, and, and they start to compare. So automatically by showing them the data and the insights about a 24 hour or yeah longer measurements, this, this conversation gets onto the table and, and gets into the discussion. That's really interesting because before people wouldn't start just talking about their sleep, they have something like, yeah, my sleep is it's private. So uh, yeah, we bring all these things together. and Yeah, I love it. So the, the final question I have, I love to ask thinkers like you about this is, let's look five, 10 years into the future. Technology is getting better and better awareness of the things you and I are so passionate about because you, your, your book is going to be uh, translated into English. So that, that gives us a good, <laughs> that gives us a good second episode follow-up. I can't wait to yeah, get yeah. on it. Uh, well, what do you think, where's this all going? If you, if you kind of look in, you know, and you can also throw in here where you want it to go as well, but we weren't even able to have this conversation probably 10 years ago because technology 
it was just too expensive. You'd had to probably go do a sleep study in a lab. You know, all this stuff was uh, really, you know, kind of priced out or inconvenient. Where do you see us going now that we, we've got Garmin's and Apple Watches and Optimal and HeartMath and all these whoops mm. around? What, what, where do you see us? Uh, where, where do you see five, 10 years in the future? Uh, wh- where are we going to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the question. And actually, I haven't thought into detail about it. But yeah, I think, of course, technology, AI, you can you cannot think it away anymore. It will be there forever. So more and more uh, having a wearable, a whoop, uh, wearing technology or having a chip put under your, your arm uh, to measure your glucose, I, it will only get more crazier and crazier. Um, and it will get more accepted also uh, by, by society. So you cannot think it away. And this is for sure not a bad thing uh, because I notice in, in the work that I'm doing that it, uh, this technology can help to bring a lot of awareness. On the other hand, with technology comes a lot of addiction or dependency of, okay, oh my God, my wearable is saying that I have slept badly now I feel bad. Eh? This, yeah. this placebo effect is also there. Eh? There are a lot of studies showing that yeah. um, that there's a placebo effect. So, with technology comes also the responsibility of 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 yeah doing something or using it for your goods and not being dependent on it. Um, so I hope that that uh, as technology improves, that also the the level of consciousness of of our human we as human beings is is going upward and that we use this technology for the good and not for the bad um i think that uh yeah in companies also and there are also some some recent research from deloitte indicating that more and more leaders see themselves within three to five years using more and more biometrical data biofeedback uh even uh yeah data from with brain waves etc all these kind of things they see it more and more being uh integrated in in company policies processes etc so um I, I think deloitte has a paper written last year about the quantified organization and all the data which is being collected and to do something of course you have all these privacy issues yeah. um so i i think it's a, it's a positive trend if we use it in a good way because there will be many companies using it to maybe say to a, a specific business units okay you're not performing well you need to get a, get rid of you so uh yeah it's it's it will be a, a knife which is cutting on two ends i don't know if you say it like this in yeah. in english but um, um so you have this technology which is yeah rapidly improving and and then I also think it will be important to have enough time to deconnect and get away from technology because that's actually also what we do in our programs. That we we use technology as a tool to support you in your journey, but on on the other hand, we try to bring people out of their regular daily environment to take a step back and take the space to look at their own life and 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 the work environment from a little bit more distance um, to to increase the awareness about the red rays they're living in. And so I, I, I think uh, having more space away from technology uh, will also be important to, to stay aware about what you're doing with it. I don't know if it makes sense. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of like the, the interesting space is like, I know for me personally, like sometimes, and I really like disconnecting and, and is heart rate variability. I hope for a lot of people, I know it is for me, even on vacation, I, I want to know, like, I, it's just part of my habit to wake up and see, and I know what a low score does now, and it's not the end of the world, but I've also mm-hmm. been doing this for five years every morning. So like it is that it's, it is that another dilemma, right? Is where we're asking people to be on technology to improve their health, while there's a lot of movement. I, I imagine around the world, around like things like social media and other things, have a a really detrimental impact. And then we we work with executives. I'm sure you do too, who won't stop mm. checking their email, and if yeah. they don't stop checking it, their people are going to be checking it, and so. There's this mix of, hey, we're, we're trying to do the good 
with it in a realm of where technology can be really harmful to people's lives and mental health. Uh, you know, is everything like you said that double-edged sword? Uh, uh, as we say mm -hmm. over here, uh, okay, you know, yeah. uh, it, it 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 plays both ways with this, which I, I think is it's good to be. I think on the the good side of the force and not the dark side. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, <laughs> that's what we should try to do. Well, well, we already got a second episode. When I get my hands on the book in English, uh, we'll we'll have to have you back. I can't wait to read it. But just and we'll put information in the show notes about where they can learn more about your work. But just if somebody's interested and they're just listening to this, where might they find a little bit more uh, about you and uh, your work? Yeah, yeah, for sure they can connect with me on on LinkedIn. I'm more, mostly active on on LinkedIn, um, so so that's where people can can find me. Uh... Awesome. Yeah. Well, and I hope indeed. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And I hope indeed at the end of the year, there will be an English version uh, available of a fully charged of the book uh, because more and more people just start asking. Um, so, yeah, I think it will be uh, work uh, for over the summer. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Well, I, I want to have you back when that happens. And uh, uh, once I once I get through it, I'm sure I'll have a million more questions to continue <laughs> The conversation but it's been great to learn about you learn about your work like i said i can't wait to get the books in my hands uh so uh yeah um yeah so thank you so much and as always thanks for listening you can find show notes everything else at optimalhrv.com and uh we'll see you next week